We're going to get started with the talk here in just a moment now that we've got the projector issues figured out. Um, a couple announcements. Uh, Nathan Voss, if you're in here. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? No. 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 How about now? Is that better? No. How about now? Excellent. OK, so before I get started, um, how many people here uh, saw the, the presentation that Carsten and I gave at CCC in Berlin? Oh, that's good. Not too many people, because this is a completely different presentation. So, <laughs> All right. So what are we going to be talking about? Um, essentially, the, the, the talk that we gave at, at CCC was um, primarily focused on the, uh, the A51 rainbow tables. Um, this talk is going to be a, a much more comprehensive overview of GSM security. Um, I'm going to explain some of the overview, uh, of the, some of the architecture of GSM, some of the crypto that lives in it. And, and as I'm explaining it, I'm going to explain some of the, the flaws in GSM um, as we go through. So um, I'm also going to be releasing um, a, a live CD called Open Boot TS. Uh, this is essentially a GSM base station in a box. Um, it has lots of, of neat capabilities. Um, and I've actually got a, a virtual machine that's running the, the, the Open Boot TS code now. So um, if, you, if you want to, to connect to my, my GSM base station here, feel free. Um, you'll, you'll need a, a quad band uh, phone because I'm running in the, the ISM band here. Um, I've also got no antennas connected, so people at the back of the room probably won't even be able to see the BTS. But feel free to do a, a scan for it, connect to it. Um, you'll need to, uh, when you connect to it, it'll send you a little text message saying, please reply with your phone number. If you reply with your 10-digit phone number, it'll authorize you onto Asterisk. And I've got voice over IP backhaul, so you can, you can try making calls. And just, just generally feel free to play with it. It's right there. Um, you have my word that there's nothing malicious going on with it. It's just a <laughs> demonstration of functionality. Where's the source code? Uh, SourceForge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, how often do people ask you to make calls during their presentation? OK, so starting from the, from the top, let's talk about some of the, the basic identifiers in GSM. Um, the first and most obvious that most people know about is the IMEI, the International Mobile Equipment Identifier. This is a, a, a number that identifies a handset. Um, it's, it's relatively easy to change your IMEI, um, and it's completely illegal to do so. You can actually buy um, cell phones that will change their IMEI on every call. So uh, quite why you'd want one, I don't know. Um, but the idea of an IMEI is that if the phone gets stolen, you can report it to your, your network operator, and uh, they'll, they'll disable the phone, which is why it's illegal to change it, because you can then use stolen phones. The IMSI is the subscriber identifier. Um, it's kind of a secret, kind of not a secret. We'll, we'll come back to what that means. Um, the point of an IMSI is that it identifies a billing account. So that is, that is your, your T-Mobile or your AT&T subscriber identifier stored in your SIM card. The TIMSI is a temporary uh, mobile subscriber identity. Um, the idea is that when you first connect to the network, you authorize yourself uh, with your IMSI, and then the network assigns you a TIMSI uh, that you use from then on to, to prevent the IMSI being transmitted too often. Um, there is a problem with that in that the, uh, the BTS can actually ask for your IMSI at any time. So this whole mechanism of, of authorizing yourself with your IMSI and then getting allocated a TIMSI is, is kind of pointless because at any point the BTS can say, hey, what's your IMSI? Um, that does actually require you to, to be connected to my BTS. So in order for me to get your IMSI, you have to connect to my BTS. Let's talk about how that happens. So when a GSM handset uh, turns on, um, it looks at a thing called a beacon channel, um, where the, the, the base stations in the area advertise themselves. Um, and they advertise primarily two numbers, uh, a mobile country code and a mobile network code. Uh, MCC for the US is 310 to 316. Um, there's a full list of, of M and MNCs and MCCs on Wikipedia. Now, the idea of an MNC and MCC is to identify a network, but it actually doesn't authenticate anything. 
So if I configured my BTS here with uh, an MNC MCC of 310-260, instead of everyone in the room having to scan for my BTS and look for it and manually connect to it, anyone who's on T-Mobile would just go, hey, there's a T-Mobile base station here. Nice strong signal, I'll connect to that. It's really that simple. It's, it's that dumb. You, you, two three-digit numbers which are publicly listed on Wikipedia, you type these into your base station and all of the handsets in the area connect to you. It's, it's really that stupid. Um, if, if you claim it, they will come. They, they really will. Um, they, they'll, the handsets will just connect to whichever tower in the area claims the right MNC MCC and has the strongest signal. So this particular attack is a, a very well-known attack. It's, it's called an IMSI catcher, um, largely because the first thing that happens when you connect to my BTS is my BTS will request your IMSI which I shouldn't ever see, so it's an IMSI catcher. Um, how do you actually build an IMSI catcher like this? Well, it's not tremendously difficult. You start out with a USRP. That gives you your, your radio hardware. Um, software called OpenBTS um, provides the, the GSM stack, and then uh, asterisk to, to connect uh, all of the, the, the GSM interface calls to voice over IP backhaul. The standard clock on the, the, the USRP runs at 64 megahertz, and it's actually got too much clock drift in it for, for, to, to be useful in GSM. It's accurate to about 20 parts per million, and the GSM spec requires the, the clock to be accurate to less than half a part per million. So that's 500 hertz of accuracy at 900 megahertz. That's, that's how stable GSM clocks have to be. So you have to modify your USRP with a, a high stability clock, um, or handsets won't be able to camp to it. It's a relatively easy soldering job. Um, all the parts are, are publicly available. Um, the software side is not tremendously difficult. It's standard GNU build chains, um, configure, make, make, install. Um, the only real difficulty with it is uh, library versions. OpenBTS has various components that have to be compiled separately, and they can be very picky about libraries. So once you've got your software all installed, you pick your MNC and your MCC. Um, you find an open channel. Sorry, ARFCON in GSM. Um, they, they, for some reason, um, Etsy, the, the, the organization that, that writes the specifications for GSM, they don't like using the same terminology as the rest of the world. So in GSM, you don't have channels. You have ARFCNs. Don't ask me why. It's just the way that they do it. So you, you pick a free channel, you set your MNC and MCC, and you wait. That's all there is to it, running an IMSI catcher. Um, if you want to actually capture calls, then you'd probably want to run Wireshark on your, your IP backhaul um, because it has a built-in SIP analyzer, so you can just say, hey, show me all the voice over IP calls. It's, it's pretty slick. So OpenBootTS, if, if the, the thought of, of compiling OpenBTS from source is, is just too much for you, um, then uh, this is what's going to help you out. The idea of OpenBootTS is it's a, uh, a set of scripts for Debian Live that produce a bootable CD image. So the idea is it's, um, you, you download the tarball and it's, um, it, uh, you run the first stage and it will download GNU Radio and OpenBTS and various libraries and it will set up an environment on your hard drive um, for producing an ISO image. Once you've, you've done that preparatory stage, you can actually make modifications to that image before you burn it. You get a full file system, you even get cherooted into it as part of the, the, the build process. And you can customize it any way that you like. So the, the image that I'm using here, I've preloaded it with my asterisk configuration, with my OpenBTS configuration, with my SMS manager configuration. Um, I, I, I'm using VMware to run it at the moment, but um, you can use virtual consoles. I have a, an init tab that runs all the various components of the system on virtual, virtual consoles. Um, it's, it's pretty sophisticated. You can customize it to, to any level that you wish, any amount of configuration that you want to put in there. Um, you can even generate different image types with it. So you don't necessarily need to commit it to an ISO for a bootable CD. You can just as easily burn it to a, a USB image that once you DD it onto a USB key, you've got a bootable USB key. You can produce pixie boot images with it, so you can boot your, your BTSs over the network. Um, all of this, it's, it's designed for, for all of this um, configuration to be done before you, you burn the ISO, um, so that when you put the ISO in the machine and, and you boot it up, it all comes straight up and it's all ready. And